Schmikago, my god, hey! Welcome back to my stage YouTube channel. If you're meeting me for the first time, hello! My name is Mickey Joe, and I'm obsessed with all things theatre, and specifically, musicals. I am here today on YouTube because I'm going to be recapping episode 2 of season 2 of Schmigadood, aka Schmikago. If you have not yet seen my review, recap, and breakdown of the first episode, I would go and watch that first, because today we are moving on to the second episode of the series. So this is season 2 of Schmigadood doing an Apple TV show that lovingly parodies musical theatre by catapulting a couple from the real world into a world filled with musical theatre characters. I'm going to be talking to you about everything that happens in the second episode of the second season, including so many musical theatre references, at least all of the ones that I was able to spot. If there are any Easter eggs or references that I do not comment on in this video, comment them down below and share them with us. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure to subscribe to my stage YouTube channel because I will be recapping all of the episodes of this season of Schmikago before too long. And if you want to watch more recaps of this series, make sure to go and subscribe to Broadway by Ghostlight, aka Mark Benani, who does a brilliant brilliant recap of this show as well. Now, let's talk about everything that happened in episode 2 of season 2 of Schmigadoon. So obviously we're going to be talking about some spoilers here. At the end of the last episode, Josh Skinner was taken away to the jail of Schmicago, having been falsely accused of murdering one of the Krat Club dancers, Elsie Vale. If this is all sounding very familiar of shows like Chicago and Cabaret, it's because it is. The first thing we notice in this episode is that we get a new title card. The traditional Schmigadoon title card is is replaced with a Schmicago one, more stylistically familiar of this slightly later era of musical theatre. We then go immediately to the jail where everyone's wearing these cute black and white striped outfits in this jail setup, and we have Titus Burgess as our narrator character, a little bit leading player from Pippin-esque, singing a reprise of the Magic To Do parody song explaining the current circumstances. We find Keegan-Michael Key as Josh in a jail cell fretting about his possible imminent death because the jail he's in seems very trigger-happy on the old electric chair. Unlike the jail in the musical Chicago, where it famously has not been used for years. Very quickly into this episode, we meet an old friend from the first season. Even though we've already spotted Jane Krakowski, Kristen Chenoweth, Alan Cumming, and a few more of the season one stars, we haven't yet spotted all of them. And in comes Aaron Tveit giving you a full head of curly hair, very John Rubenstein from the original production of Pippin, very Victor Garber from the original production of Godspell, but more so than either of those, looking very much like Claude from the musical Hair. He's playing a character called Topher, who I'm guessing is some kind of an amalgamation of all of these, because he is spreading peace and love and feels very Jesus from Godspell-esque, very Claude from Hair-esque, but then sings a song that is such a close parody of Corner of the Sky from Pippin, it made me laugh at every single turn. The piano introduction was giving me corner of the sky. In the original song where you have like rivers belong where they can ramble, eagles belong where they can fly, like almost line for line they've parodied these ideas talking about camels and like a table fits with a chair and it's it's hilarious. It's a song that wouldn't be funny by itself but in context as a parody is just beautifully silly. One of the things I really love about this series is the way that it inserts real life people into these musical theatre situations and allows them to make candid observations about the circumstances that they are in. So by the end of this episode you have them commenting on Aaron Tveta's Topher bursting into song self-indulgently and they repeatedly remind him that this moment isn't necessarily about him, as well as Keegan-Michael Key pointing out to him that for all of his concern about not having found his purpose, he's a rich white boy and he's gonna be fine. Honestly, if someone had pointed that out to Pippin, that musical would have been a lot shorter. As he's talking to the other prisoners in the jail, there is a fleeting Bye Bye Birdie reference with a character called Conrad who's dressed all in gold. I have to confess, I don't know the musical Bye Bye Birdie that well, but I know that reference when I hear it. I love that when Aaron Tveit is singing Corner of the Sky, they also let him do a parody of the iconic corner of the sky high note at the very end of the song. Love that. That's a gift to us all. We then cut back to Melissa, who is on her way to go and secure legal representation for her falsely accused husband. Now, in the first episode, there's a couple of things I want to remind you of. We saw a shot of the street, and in the background, we saw a sign that said Bobby Flanagan, attorney at law, or something to that effect. And when Elsie Vale, the crack club dancer, was found dead, you could just about make out a Bobby tattoo on her shoulder in the middle of a love heart. Well, we're about to meet Bobby Flanagan, who is obviously a Billy Flynn alternative, Bobby Billy Flynn Flanagan, but it's not who you might expect. It's Jane Krakow 
Lewandowski in a power suit being a girl boss lady lawyer, or as they are also known, simply lawyers. It could just be a simple like change of Billy Flynn to be a woman and like Billy becomes Bobby, fine, but it also feels a little bit like a nod to the recent company revival where Bobby became Bobby, a female Bobby, and the character was gender swapped. Here you have a classic male character who's been gender swapped using the same name. On the wall behind her we can see this framed news clipping that uses the word frazzles and dazzles, a nod to the song Razzle Dazzle from the musical Chicago which Billy Flynn sings. All of this is taking place amongst a sort of a vampy delivery. It's not necessarily a full song, but Jane Krakowski is speaking over some underscoring that is very familiar of the song Roxy. That whole bam, 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 da, da. I maintain no one writes vamps like John Kander. And the speech that Krakowski gives here as Bobby Flanagan is half Roxy, like she literally says, law school was a world full of no, which is basically a line out of Roxy in Chicago. But she also says, after a while I caught on, which feels like a nod to Val in a chorus line in the speech that she gives before singing the song Dance 10 Looks 3. We continue with the chorus line references as we go into the next scene. So Bobby Flanagan goes to meet with Josh in the jail and she encourages Melissa to obviously help exonerate him by going and auditioning to be a replacement dancer in the Krat Club, because that obviously is the most obvious thing for her to do. So Melissa turns up to this audition sequence being run by Anne Harada's character, Madame Frau. And of course, how else are we going to parody an audition sequence if not by using a chorus line? Important to note here, first of all, Madame Frau, who is running this audition, is bashing a cane on the floor. That's giving me fame, but it's also giving me a little bit Madame Giry from The Phantom of the Opera. They then perform a very familiar take on the opening from a chorus line with God I Hope I Get It. They do the exact chorus line choreography. The da -da 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 -ba -ba. I love that they use the same introduction to this song that Zach says in the show, but where Zach says, let's do the whole combination facing away from the mirror, where they'd be using the mirror to rehearse because they can see themselves. And Harada says, let's do the whole combination facing away from the wall like that would have made any kind of, like why were they facing the wall in the first place? I love that they just say that unironically and where Zach goes five, six, seven, eight, she's obviously a very austere uh, German woman. So she says fünf, six, sieben, acht. It's the details I enjoy, the little details. Melissa joins these much more talented dancers and you get a little bit of the vibes of Fanny Bryce's first vaudeville audition from Funny Girl, where she is quirky and funny, but she's certainly not as strong a dancer as everyone around her. They are quick to notice this and they criticize her and one of them points out that she pops her head, something Cassie in a chorus line is famously known for. Don't pop the head Cassie. As this section continues, much like in a chorus line, the dancers are prompted to reveal things about themselves and why they started to dance. And the first one is underscored by at the ballet and she talks about parents having had a difficult relationship. The next one is underscored by the introduction of nothing. And then the last one is underscored by the music and the mirror. Following this, Melissa ends up performing something very familiar of Music in the Mirror, and they do some Music in the Mirror choreography, and the whole section ends with her in the iconic Music in the Mirror Cassie pose. The whole, I'm reaching for something and it's over there, and I don't know what it is, but it's, it's probably financial stability. Circling back, one of the dancers who gave a little monologue was so clearly based on, like specifically Liesl from The Sound of Music because she said she once asked her father for champagne at a party like Liesl does in the song So Long, Farewell, Alvida Saying Goodnight and she says I'd like to stay and taste my first champagne and she says yes and her father says no and so she says that he refused her but he was dating this woman with a title aka the Baroness. This seems to bear no relationship to the parodies of those two same characters we met in the first season of Schmigadoon but it's another fun little musical theatre easter egg. After that when Melissa sings her version of the music and the mirror she says a doctor doctors which is a parody of god i'm a dancer a dancer dances and not that i need to explain it to you but it's funny because a doctor doctors doesn't make sense whereas a dancer dances does oh that was almost 
a tongue twister. And of course, we can't parody this number without recreating the iconic final shot where they all lift up their headshots over their faces. She doesn't have one with her, so she reaches in and pulls out her driving license and puts it over her face instead. A very funny contemporary take on that from a normal person inserted into this scenario that she recognizes but isn't prepared to participate in. We then cut back to the jail where Bobby Flanagan is arriving in a stunning white outfit complete with fur and fedora. And they sing a song that's a little bit all I care about is love, but the beginning part where they're like, we want Billy. But it's also a little bit like the first song in Company. Bobby, 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 baby, Bobby, booby. Kind of confirming my suspicions from what I said earlier about the two inspirations for the character. Melissa, meanwhile, gets the job and is hired as the new dancer in the Krat Club. Preparing her for her opening, she's offered rouge for her knees, which is a Chicago reference. I'm gonna rouge my knees and roll my stockings down. And we kind of take a little bit of time to consider what the heck that's about and why someone would actually like rouge and contour their knees. There's one dancer who's leaving the dressing room as she's entering in an outfit that kind of looks like it belongs in the masquerade scene from Phantom. This could be coincidental or it could be a deliberate homage. Dove Cameron's character Jenny Banks meanwhile invites Melissa to be her new roommate, confirming that her last roommate was Elsie, who has recently died, as per the song Cabaret, where Elsie was Sally Bowles' former roommate. Returning to Josh and Bobby Flanagan, they hold a press conference where everything is meant to go as planned in a scene, not a song, that parodies the concept of We Both Reached for the Gun, where Bobby has given Josh this prepared speech where he confesses to this crime he didn't commit but blames the whole thing on jazz. She said repeatedly by this point that the law is more about fooling the press and showmanship and she uses a bunch of a bunch of fake words like flim fladdle and flap dazzle and stuff like that in order to suggest this. Josh goes a little bit off script and we have some reporter characters. We also have the same lady we met in the lobby of the hotel in the first episode, who said, I'll drink to that. She just says, I'll drink to that again. She's still drawn from company, just drinking around town in the middle of the day. And we also have a little newsy child, a newsboy reading out damning headlines on a newspaper that seems to go to print impossibly quickly. Now, newsies, not specifically from this era of musical theater, but you know, also very at home in this kind of a time period. So we'll forgive that one. That makes sense to put a newsie in there. We've got a little bit more plot to deal with as we head up to the apartment apartment, which Jenny Banks now shares with Melissa. It's a lot more glamorous than the room that Melissa and Josh were first offered. And some of the musical underscoring of this scene seems to actually parody, I used to have a girlfriend known as Elsie, just really laboring that point. It's at this point that Sergeant Rivera returns in order to summon Jenny Banks down to dinner with her new admirer, also her boss, the owner of the club, Mr. Kratt himself. And the fact that this member of the police is in his employ starts to suggest to us what characters we might be meeting here. They're giving off a distinctly Judge Turpin and Beadle Bamford vibe, the levels of power and corruption, and utilizing those in order to manipulate young women and the older of the two using the member of police at his disposal and the fact that he then threatens Melissa, it feels very familiar of those two characters and their relationship. We then finally get another song and it's Melissa, Jenny Banks and Ariana DeBose's character performing a little trio in the club for Melissa's debut and it's a parody of Sometimes You Could Drive a Person Crazy, again from the musical Company. But it's very cutesy and they're in prisoner outfits and they're chained together. It's very cute little choreo. It's actually a very well-written pastiche that feels familiar not only if you could drive a person crazy and they do the whole like do 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 but it also reminds very much of one of Miss Adelaide's hotbox numbers from Guys and Dolls. Something like, I thought that each expensive thing you obtained was a token of your esteem. It could very much be one of those numbers. What's great about this is the lyrics of it are all about busting out of jail. And at the same time, you guessed it, Josh is being busted out of jail by a happily timed arrival of hippies. Topher's hippie comrades drive a bus into the back of the jail, knocking down the wall and invite him to leave. Now, a few things are happening here. Titus Burgess pops up amongst them and very adamantly encourages Josh to go with them. Now, whenever the leading player from Pippin really encourages you to do something, you should start to be suspicious of it because usually it's not going to end well. That's a red flag going off in my musical theater brain. The other thing I enjoy about this is we didn't really get 
numbers in the first season of Schmigadoon that sophisticatedly jumped between two different settings like this. And it's a nod to what a lot of songs in this new period of musical theatre used to do. They're serving two purposes. The song feels like it's about one thing, but really its lyrics are suggesting something else at the same time. You're getting a number that just looks like a fun club number, but really it's talking about another scene that's happening simultaneously. It's starting to get a little bit more sophisticated in its development and writing. The last little Easter egg I want to share with you from this scene is a piece of evidence that Melissa finds in Elsie's dressing room, which she is given after her rapturous reception in this number. She finds a little book with an address written in it, an address in Quick Street. Now, Quick Street could be one of two things, and it's a word, quick, that is synonymous both with perhaps fleeting or with perhaps something being quick and simple. That suggests to me either Fleet Street from Sweeney Todd, quick, fleeting, or Easy Street, the one that's sung about in Annie, quick, easy. I think it's meant to nod to both of these ideas. Like I said, we've already met a Sweeney Todd looking character in Alan Cumming, and I maintain that Kristen Chenoweth's Mrs. Lovett character by his side, who has a Cockney accent, also looks to me so much like a Miss Hannigan. And we've seen orphans, and we've heard the orphan names mentioned that were given to the Crack Club girls. So I do think we're doing Annie and we're doing Sweeney Todd, and I think Quick Street is an amalgamation of those two ideas. Let us not forget that Kristen Chenoweth and Alan Cumming have appeared on screen together before, as Lily St. Regis and Rooster in the remake movie of Annie. So while I do think the two of them will be giving us Sweeney and Lovett, I think there's also some Annie Miss Hannigan moments on the cards. I'm convinced about this one, you can't tell me otherwise. So what did I actually think of this episode? I really enjoyed it. I think we're starting to get a little bit formulaic in some of the plot. You know, a lot of it legal wise was just like the plot of Chicago with the introduction of the Billy Flynn character. I am now at this point impatient for Jane Krakowski to get to do a full glitzy showgirl number. It's what she deserves. I loved her number in the car in the first season, but she now needs something very, very dancey. Because while we're doing these chorus line pastiches and these Chicago pastiches, let's face it, she is the one best positioned within this ensemble cast to give us a rock Roxy Hart, Velma Kelly moment. I mean, her and Ariana DeBose. Let's make that a hot honey rag. I've spoken that into existence. I love that Aaron got to do a corner of the sky moment. I'm enjoying his character very much. They're once again letting him be wistful and dumb, which I think is a very charming color on him. We're getting a little bit more sincerity from Dove Cameron's character. She had a little bit of a moment right towards the end of that one where she was suddenly very honest about her circumstances and that she was doing all of this just in order to survive. I like what the showbiz life is bringing out in Melissa. And I like that we're starting to get these musical numbers that are a little bit more sophisticated. And I like where we're getting things that reference multiple different shows at once. I think that's very clever. I'm excited about where we're going with this. I'm excited about the level of tension and unease that is being instilled in all of these characters. And I'm excited for us to be given more little nuggets and clues so that we can try and work out what's going on. Hopefully the whole thing won't just be very obviously spoon fed to us. I like to solve a mystery. So very excited for the next episode. These first two dropped at the same time, but there will now be a little bit of a wait for episode three. In the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed today's video. Make sure you're subscribed to my channel so you do not miss any of the content I make about the rest of the season of Schmicago. As a reminder, go and make sure you subscribe to Broadway by Ghostlight as well. He makes great content around this series and I cannot recommend his videos enough. Thank you so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down below with what you thought of episode two of season two of Schmigadoon, as well as telling us what your favorite musical theater reference was from this episode and telling me about any that I might have missed. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For 10 more seconds. I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey. Thanks for watching. Have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>